Welcome back to the Multics podcast. Today our guest is Eva Bertesing, and also here today are Boya. Hi. Eric. Hi. And I'm Hannah. Eva is a postdoc in the Case Deckers Research Group at the Technical University of Delft. Her work is focused on building artificial systems that are inspired by natural components of the cell. In particular, she is working on biomimetic systems to study transport of molecules through the nuclear pore complex. She obtained her PhD in 2021, working in Hendrik Dietz's group at the Technical University of Munich. During this time, she built a novel rotating nanostructure made of DNA origami components with interlocked and coupled motion. This work was chosen as one of the finalists of the CENS Nano Innovation Award 2021. She got her MSc degree at the Technical University of Munich and her BSc in physics studying at Padua University and at the Georg August University in Göttingen. Over, hi. Hi. Uh, so Ava's presenting a post this day on her work on, on DNA rotors. Um, so the listeners at home, you might want to go to the show notes of this episode and pull up a copy of that to follow along. Um, but before getting into that, I thought we could find out a little bit more about you and how you got to doing the research project that you're presenting. Um, so maybe we could start with how did you end up moving from physics into DNA nanotechnology? So actually, while I was doing my bachelor, I studied physics. And then for the master, I wanted to specialize on something. And um, actually, when I was like 14 or 15, my dream job would have been to be like a particle physicist, um, which I think is also maybe more natural for physicists um, or or something that we also study more during, um, for example, the bachelor or the studies anyway. But then I came across a couple of papers about uh, like biological physics and the fact that we could study life from a mathematical and physical point of view, it was just super exciting. And so I decided to go to biophysics. And then um, for my master thesis, I was looking a bit around and Hendrik held um, a talk back then at the university. And then there he showed that he was building small objects with DNA. And I remember this like picture of um, a robot made of DNA. So the robot could not really do anything. It was really just a shape of the robot and could like open and close the arm depending on the salt condition. And uh, also there I was just flashed. I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. <laughs> um, and so I started there as um, for my master projects and then I continued for um, my PhD as well. So the project was quite long. It took like, I think five years almost. So yeah, it was kind of complicated, but um, also very nice to get kind of the end of it. So when going into that, did you think, did you find that your undergraduate degree prepared you for going into more biochemical systems or was there a lot to learn? Well, during my master with biophysics, we could learn a little bit of biochemistry and other stuff. And of course, um, like also the physics background is a bit different from biochemical one, but I think they are also complementary because you learn also like you don't only learn some subjects, but it's also the way of reasoning and the way of, of seeing things. They are different, but also complementary. And also by collaborating or just talking with um, the other PhD students, you can get really different insights. And I think it's it's really beautiful also from these biophysical groups that you have biotechnologists, biophysicists, chemists. It's very like diverse in this sense. And so you can learn from everyone um, and also with all these different point of views. Is there any part of you that wishes you did pursue particle physics? Is there any part longing for that alternative life? Um, not really. I mean, I'm also interested in this and sometimes if I have some occasion to read some stuff, um, then of course I'm, I'm still interested in it, but I'm, I'm really happy, um, with, with biophysics. And I think also there's, um, a lot of groups doing biophysics right now, and there are really such a plethora of things that one can do because you can study cells, you can go to bigger systems, smaller systems. So there's really like still a lot um, to discover in this subject. How would you describe that uh, learning curve of going from physics to then having to do, learn a lot of the groundwork for biology and biochemistry, like learning about the DNA bases? How would you describe that process? 
Well, it was, it was um, not so easy or not so immediate, of course, because also I started in the second semester. So um, I was already behind <laughs> the other people, so to say. And I had really to learn a lot by myself. I remember one of the first lectures that we had was like a seminar where we had to read a paper and then present it. And I had this paper and I had to Google every single word, basically, <laughs> of this paper because also what DNA was, what a protein was. I mean, I had some ideas, but not really like precise definition and what all the components are, how they can react together. So it was kind of like hard at the beginning. Um, but I think also by doing, um, you can learn a lot. And also in, in the university where I was, there was this possibility to work in the lab as a working student. And so I had also this this chance to really see um, from myself also during the studies how a lab work and how all the things work and of course it's then easier also to learn. Okay so I think now might be a good time to to move on to the poster so um, hopefully everyone listening has got other copies so um, Eva do you want to introduce um, what, what this project is? So for this project, we took inspiration from a um, biological system, which is the ATP synthase. And this um, is a, basically a molecular machine that transforms um, a flow of proton to ATP. And it is also reversible, so it can also use ATP to pump the proton on the other direction. And the efficiency of this molecular machine is almost 100%. It is fully reversible. So to be able to accomplish something like this, Artificially, of course, it would be a very huge, um, let's say, loop or a very huge um, jump in, in technology and, and also abilities that we, um, that we or knowledge that we might um, acquire. And so this is where we started, try to replicate this mechanism. And first of all, we really wanted to replicate just, you know, this rotating mechanism with the allosteric. So in the ATP synthase, we have a central rotor that can um, basically rotate around, um, driven by this proton flow. And this rotor can interact with a stator. And the stator has kind of threefold symmetry. And depending on the position of this central rotor, the stator can open or close. And depending on this opening or closing, then the ATP is produced. So we wanted to try to build such a mechanism. And our nanostructure is then composed very similarly to the ATP synthase via central rotor and then this stator that has this threefold symmetry. And so the goal here is to have this rotation of, of the um, central rotor that is coupled to the motion of, um, of the say, stator. So if you see, the stator has this like movable parts and they are like doors or poles that can open and close. And so depending also here, depending on the position of the central rotor, then um, the goal was to have these poles to move um, or, or to open up. I really like that you take inspiration from ATP synthase. I remember when I first learned about it and it was so interesting and fascinating how it worked, whether so obviously the main principles you took were the rotor and the stator. Were there any principles from ATP synthase that you kind of ignore or abstract away in this project to kind of make things simpler? Um, yes, actually a lot, I would say. So the ATP synthase, for example, can perform directional motion. So always, for example, um, clockwise or anti-clockwise, and we are not quite there yet. So the motion that we could perform was just Brownian motion, so random. Um, we could still show that this Brownian motion of the central rotor was coupled to the motion of these poles of the stator, but um, it's not rotating in one direction yet. And I think this is actually very crucial if we want to have an application uh, for the future, because of course, by controlling the motion of the central rotor, you can also control the stator or also the other way around, of course. So this was, of course, the first one. And then also the ATP synthase can perform catalysis on the stator because ATP is, is synthesized from ADP and phosphate. And of course, we cannot do that yet. But it would be, of course, really interesting if, or like, let's say, um, a future perspective of this project is um, to be able maybe to perform some catalysis on the nanoscale. 
How does the directional motion in the ATP synthase work? Is it driven by the proton flow or is it some sort of ratchet mechanism that prevents it from moving backwards during either ATP production or ATP consumption? So the, the ATP synthase is anchored into a membrane. And so we have, first of all, this separation and we have these protons that flow. And when the, like, the proton flows inside um, of, um, of this transmembrane part, let's say, of the ATP synthase, there are some conformational changes there that makes the rotor rotate in one direction. And of course, it's always stochastic because at that scale, we have um, always kind of Brannon motion, but the Brannon motion is then rectified into a, a directional motion. So actually, we have also some step backwards but on average, then we are moving on in, in one direction. But it's like, I think the, the trick there are these conformational changes that happen and they are all coupled together. So like there are conformational changes on, on the transmembrane part that are transmitted to this um, central rotor. And then this in like transmits the motion to the stator and everything changes um, accordingly. And if I remember right, is it, Correct that I, I think it differs between species, but maybe in E. coli there are like eleven of these monomers in the transmembrane part, and then like protons will bind to each of those monomers and kind of wrap around as the whole mechanism rotates, and then they'll be kind of released on the other side. It, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. This like these eleven parts that you're talking about is on the transmembrane protein. And I think it depends on, on the species, or there are some that has eight, some that there's 11, um, or also, I think, even more in some species. And it's also really interesting because mo mo like most of the time, um, we have a number of protons that do not really correspond to the number of ATP because we have always like three pockets. So in one, we have like one is empty, one have we have ADP and phosphate in the other ATP. So we have basically this three step, but on the transmembrane pro, um, part, we have, for example, 11 protons, which is not like div dividable by three. So it's always a little, there's this mismatch that is not um, super straightforward, at least for me at the beginning. Yeah, it's interesting how you kind of like convert between the free energy change of passing protons across and the free energy change of creating three ATPs from mm. ADP. What brings the ATP synthesis to your attention? So it is a um, very tiny mechanism, let's say, but it's super efficient. So we have this efficiency of almost 100%. And also what is really interesting is that um, the ATP synthase is actually two motors. So we have this transmembrane part, which is one motor with the proton flow. And then the other motor is the one with the like rotor and stator. They are connected together and you can... Um, it's exactly this conversion between like proton and ATP or the other way around. And this is like basically impossible in how our you know, world, because if you have a flow of energy, for example, from one side to the other, um, you can maybe go back sometimes, but like the efficiency is not always 100% and there is not really a reversible motor, like a completely reversible motor. And so I was really intrigued by this, energy efficiency and this reversibility and really to build something like this artificially, it would be, I think, um, super important and also very, um, very cool, basically. So I think you built um, your, your rotary mechanism out of DNA origami. Um, so how did you go about doing that? Was it kind of a standard DNA origami setup or were there any interesting challenges there? No, the, um, these structures that I used were completely uh, new. So I had to design them from, from scratch, basically. And also here, I tried to take inspiration from um, the ATP synthase. So the central rotor, which actually we called camshaft in, like, in comparison to a real motor, let's say. We have this asymmetric feature, um, which is also present in, in the ATP synthase. And then I tried to have a stator, which was kind of closing um, up the camshaft, and they also had this threefold symmetry. Um, of course, there were some challenges because it's um, a um, tetramer. So you need to have 
particles that are different enough that you can distinguish them. So also you can recognize the position of the central rotor um, with respect to the, the other components of the stator. But also it has to be stable enough because, of course, you don't want your, your, um, your complex to fall apart. So this was kind of challenging. But the design itself with DNA origami was um, actually very funny and very intriguing and also to understand like what's in your mind you have to do like kind of project and see if then nature is also like does agree with you or not you know was this the original design that you started with or there has been multiple rounds of edits of changing how it how it's designed there were multiple rounds um of course but the main i would say the core was uh, was always the same. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with DNA origami or our listeners are familiar with DNA origami, but we have basically a long strand, which we call scaffold. And then you add like hundreds of shorter oligonucleotides and these oligonucleotides binds to the scaffold and fold it to the desired shape. Um, and let's say that the lay down of the scaffold remained the same from the beginning to the end. But of course, then the connections of the oligos, um, I had to change them because sometimes, for example, I realized that some parts were a little bit too flexible or too rigid and I wanted to change them. And so I had to, to do some modifications. How are you able to uh, do that optimization? Is it f Are you getting the information on which pieces are not forming well or are too flexible from the molecular simulations that we're going to talk about later? Are these from the cryo-electron microscopy data or is this from your own intuition as a DNA engineer? So first of all, of course, you have to have the idea um, of how your particle would look like. And um, what we use normally is... Um, um, honeycomb lattice or a um, square lattice so of course there there are some limitations because you can you can build almost every shape but of course you have always this constraint of the honeycomb lattice and, and the square lattice and also of course the dna is double strands and we have these uh, windings so you have also to pay attention on where the dna is pointing in that precise position um, but once you do this, and there are some softwares that you can use to do this, you try to fold it. Um, and then there are several tools that we have or several techniques to check it. For example, gel electrophoresis, TAM, cryo-EM. And of course, with cryo-EM, like cryo-EM is a very important tool because you can see really your structure in three dimension and see if you have done any mistakes. Um, the simulation for me came a little bit later, and we used them mostly to um, to study the whole complex, so the whole tetramers. But for like the small design, we based um, our final iteration on on cryo -EM, basically. I'm not so familiar with cryo -EM. I'm wondering because to me those images look very similar. If you change some designs, is it obvious to spot that um, the structure forms in and the cryo -EM images are different? And what's the resolution for that? Yeah, so um, it depends. For example, if you have very different particle shape, of course, you will notice that. So you see in the um, on the bottom left where the cryo-EM characterization is, in this first panel, you see, of course, already from the, like these circles are the 2D classes, 2D class averages. And you see, of course, from there already that the particles have, Kind of different shapes but for example the stator particles are very similar to each other and from a first glance also from the micrograph itself you cannot really recognize it so you really need to do the 3d classification and then study the map and see where the difference are um, are so for example here these three monomers have actually um, a little bit different shapes because, of course, I wanted to be able to recognize them when they are assembled into a stator. And there we have really like four helices that are positioned in different part, and um, you can really see them and see the difference only when you do the three D classification and you look um, to the map. Do those differences in the stator monomers impact the rotation, or are they just kind of? make it more visible when you're looking at them? 
I was trying actually to make the monomers as similar as possible to each other so that they don't have like a, my camshaft or my central rotor that have a as a preference to one of, of them, of course. So the differences are on the back side and um, so that the camshaft um, doesn't see it, so to say. Um, in, also in this panel here, which I was referring of the 3D classification and the 3D maps of the monomers, you see this small red arrow. So if you compare this orange monomer to the blue and the green one, you see that we have these protruding helices. And this is one of their difference. For example, it's very small, but if you compare the three maps, you can really see it and recognize which monomer is which. Also, when you have the whole complex assembled. So in these cryo-EM structures, you not only characterize each of the monomers and then the full structure, you also then characterize some motion. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you did that with cryo-EM? Because I usually think of it as you get kind of an average structure. Yes, that's true. So um, you you get always an average structure, but of course, if your uh, structure or your complex then has different um, positions or different conformation, then if you have enough of them, you should be able to recognize them or to classify them out. It was not super straightforward, so I had to take like a really lot of data, of course, because you want to have enough particles for each um, for each class. But at the end, if you look at the um, bottom part, basically, what we did was first to bind actually the camshaft to each of the stator monomer. And we basically did three different samples where the camshaft was bound um, once to the first one, once to the second one, and once to the third one, just to have an idea how it would look like and if it was possible at all. And this was the case because you see here the 3D maps. We have also the three different position of the central rotor with respect to the stator. And then we tried to build the same structure, but this time the camshaft was not bound to any of the state of the stator monomer. And then we image um, with cryo-EM and we tried to classify. And we could actually find basically almost the same conformation as um, the bound one. So we have really the central rotor that is changing position. And here with simple 3D classification, we found three classes basically, which are also like the main population, let's say. But then in the last year, some other techniques came out. It's called a PCA, so principal component analysis. And using this, you can basically analyze the residual motions of your particles. And what we found out was that our camshaft was really rotating around. So you see this nice picture where the um, central rotor is basically covering the whole angle, like 360 degree angle. And there we could really see that the, that the central rotor was actually moving inside and did not have only these three preferred conformation. So here, um, I think I was really lucky somehow that these all these tools for cryogam was were coming up while I was doing my research here because I could really try them all and see if I could um, if I could use them for for my project. That must have been really reassuring to see kind of it actually rotating rather than just adopting three different positions. How did it feel when you saw that cryo EM result? Had it taken like months or years to work up to that point? So um, it took quite some some times. I think like three a year or three and a half years. And the first time I saw this picture, I was really super happy because I could finally see that the this camshaft was, as you said, um, it was really rotating around and it was fulfilling also a bit um, what we were, we, what we planned to do. And I, I really think also that is actually a very nice picture um, also just to, to look. <laughs> So how much time did it take to image all of this? Did you basically spend that three and a half years doing cryo-electron for cryo-electron for cryo-electron, or was there other things going on in there too? So cryo-EM is quite time expensive, I would say, because you need to acquire a lot of um, images and then also process. Luckily, the microscope that we were using was um, fully automated, so you just needed to spend some hours, let's say, for all the calibration and 
all like um, to tell the microscope where to take the images and then the actual image acquisition is automatic and also with the time there are some tools for example automatic particle picking and um, to declassification where the user has to do uh, less and less let's say but of course it was quite time expen- um, extensive um, in, in the sense that they had to prepare quite a lot of different samples and also image um, a lot of grids because to have all these like high na- um, number of particles then you just need a lot of data and also the particles are actually massive so one um, monomer is um, around f- five megadalton so one complex is 20 megadalton and this also means that in one image you don't get a lot of them there were maybe i don't know between 10 and 50 let's say so you need also of course a lot of um, images then to get um, to such high number of particles beside this cry em we had also this um, fluorescence microscopy um, analysis that we wanted to 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 use or, or to do because of course uh, as you said also before cryo yam is more like a static view so you take a snapshot and you might be able to see the different conformations and everything but it's still um, just a, a, a static photo and of course to see it in real time it would have been better and like we tried with fluorescence microscopy um, so looking at your your next panel it looks like you attached some kind of rod to to your system and, and looked at it in your time where you and inspi- this reminds me of um experience with atv synthase where i think they attach things like that in order to watch it in real time were you inspired by those experiments yes yes of course there they used um i think an actin filament to track the motion of the atp synthase and very similarly in our case um the microscope that we like with the microscope that we had we could not really see the motion of this short part of the of the rotor so we had to elongate it to to track it but also a bit to slow down because um, the speed of the rotation also depends on the on the length of this lever arm and of course we want to to see in in real time and also with a camera um, that has like some some kind of frame rate um, then we needed to slow it down otherwise we would not be um, have been able to to see really the the rotation was the length of the lever arm something that you kind of designed taking into account the drag forces and the camera resolution or did you kind of just say okay we have this design in the lab this is probably good enough or where, where did that precise length come from um so I designed this, uh, this, it's another DNA nanostructure, of course, and I designed it based on the cross section of this um, small part of the central rotor. And this is a 10 helix bundle. So I just took the, um, like the scaffold that we had and designed a 10 helix bundle. And this is the maximum like that we could reach with the scaffold. Actually, if one wants to, for example, slow down it a little bit more, we could just attach another of the structure at the end, but we never did it, actually. How fast does this rotor rotate? So this is um, kind of a tricky question because it's not rotating on one direction, but it's doing this random branial motion. So you have sometimes it uh, rotates clockwise and sometimes um, counterclockwise. And if you look at the panel where it's written Brownian motion, there is one of um, of the graphs that is the um, angular velocity. I think it's the panel E. So you see that most of the particles are picking around zero because this is like um, the average angular velocity of of all the of, of all our particles. So we have some particles that, or like the same particles, sometimes go counterclockwise, sometimes go um, clockwise, and so in on average we have zero. But we have also particles that are much faster. So here, for example, the maximum is around um, 1500 degrees per second. So this was basically the maximum speed that we could reach. But as you can see, um, it's not a lot of particles. So of course, most of them are on average um, performing like zero angular velocity, so to say. So obviously you you were just going for kind of a Brownian rotational motion in, in this project. 
do you have any ideas of what would be needed to get this from kind of random unbiased motion to biased motion and just being able to power it in a single direction? Yes, so um, there are some efforts also in this direction from multiple groups. So one one thing would be, for example, to immerse everything into um, a field, for example, an electric field. Um, and so this could drive, of course, the motion um, of, of our particles. The CML group, for example, did this with um, also with a rotor, and the rotor could really follow very nicely the direction of the field. So what is needed also in nature for, for rectifying this motion is an asymmetric energy landscape. So if we were able to build an asymmetric um, energy landscape, then probably this particle would also perform unidirectional motion. But of course, it's, um, it's not so easy and there are a lot of things still to implement. So it would be another project, I would say, a very huge one indeed. <laughs> Also on that note, do you have any thoughts as to like what kinds of uh, activities or catalysis you'd like to see attached to this DNA structure? Because we, we started talking about the ATP synthase, which is very small and builds ATP. What, what could we do with this larger but also rotary nanostructure? Well, of course, performing some catalysis would be like the dream. And we could try, for example, with ATP. But I think also um, very like our very naive idea is that you bring two components together and they do catalysis but probably it's not what's um what's happening also in nature so you need to, first of all for example the orientation of the components um, play a role of course and there might be some other um elements that we are not really um aware of yet it it, it might still be um very tricky to reach something like this I guess let's segue into the final panel now, um, where you did a bunch of molecular simulations here. So what, what did the molecular simulations add to the paper? You mentioned earlier that they came kind of at the end. Um, what were you looking for with the molecular simulations? So the molecular sim simulation um, were actually done by our collaborators. So it's um, Christopher Maffeo from Aximentive uh, Group. And what we were trying to see here was if we could see the coupled motion between the, the central rotor and the stator monomers. So what we did was um, to change a bit the, um, the stator monomers, because we have these uh, with different doors or the poles that can open and close, and we wanted to change kind of the strength. So we want to do some poles that were more rigid and some that were more flexible and see if we could um, see a change in the rotation of the central of the central rotor. And we wanted to see this with um, with molecular sim dynamic simulation because I think you can have really a deeper insight on what is going on and also in a more controlled way than in experiments. And so here what we tried to simulate was all these different variants of the stator. So we had um, this, uh, stators that were more rigid or more flexible and we did, did this by basically binding these poles together or releasing these poles so they're not bound together and they are, they are more, fle more flexible. And then with the molecular dynamic simulation, we really studied, we forced the rotation, for example, of the central rotor and we saw how this pole, um, the, the pole movement reacts. And so, for example, if you see in the panel on the left, you clearly see that there is a global motion of, of, of the stator while the rotor changes. And to see something like this would be very difficult in using experiments. You could, of course, um, use cryo-EM again, but these smaller motion are really difficult to detect with the state-of-the-art cryo-EM techniques right now. So with this, we could really also kind of calculate the amount of, of displacement of these poles, um, for example, from the center, um, and it was really a powerful tool for us also to understand what was going on. And experimentally, we could see um, that by changing this pole strength or, or also the, the flexibility and the rigidity of these poles, um, the, the, the camshaft rotation was changing. So we had faster or slower depending on, on the 
on the rigidity of the stator. So it was also nice to combine these two techniques together or to see both point of view. So from the stator and also from the camshaft. Were there any big surprises from the molecular dynamics that you didn't expect to see? Or was it all pretty much it worked as intended, just now you have higher resolution? I have to think a bit about this because it was kind of surprising, I, I would say experimentally, because we designed some stator and we said, okay, this kind of stator should have probably a behavior between, for example, version one and version four. And then experimentally, we saw this, it was kind of completely different. And then we had to understand why it was different and what we would expect and why it was not like this. For the molecular dynamic simulation, I think it was super nice the first time that we saw that um, by forcing the camshaft to rotate in only one direction. And we saw really that the stator was also moving accordingly and changing um, the position accordingly. It was it, it was really a relief, but also very, very nice feeling, so to say. Um, and it is also a very complex system because we have these four monomers that are interacting together. So um, it was not really natural for me that it would work. Also because I'm not really in the field of molecular dynamic simulation. So um, I was really, really happy when we saw that, that it could um, show us uh, this. So when you guys were collaborating with the molecular dynamics group, did you guys just kind of send them the designs and let them like do the project and then let them come back to you with results? Or did you guys really like work closely and collaborate a lot on uh, how, how, what simulations to run and analyzing the results together? Like how, how did that collaboration work out? So um, we, we had almost all the variants I say um, already experimentally analyzed and we were not really quite understanding what was going on. So we sent a couple of designs to them. And then we, of course, talked together a lot, like um, what would be also what would be important, because I think at the time, for example, some interaction were not um, in the force field, were not like implementing the force field. Um, and uh, I know that Chris um, did some quite, quite some modifications, for example, for the base stacking and to analyze everything properly, and also to see if we needed, for example, an all atomic simulation or maybe something more coarse grain was enough. And so then I think one of the last designs we actually um, implemented by looking at the simulation and looking at the results and see if we could um, do something different and see, um, for example, creating a more flexible version. And also all the results, of course, we analyzed everything together and um, it was it was um, very fruitful. And like, let's say, unluckily, it was at the end of the project. So we we had like a, 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 a strict collaboration, but it was um, only for a few months, let's say. So what are the uh, biggest challenge in doing this project? So I think the biggest challenge for me for doing this project was really um, struggling with the cryo yam because at the beginning, um, so in, in cryo yam we have this um, resolution revolution. It's, it's called like this that in 2016 some new software and also some new hardware um, came out. For example, direct electron detector, and I started my master with this project around that time. So it was really like evolving, or my project was evolving with also the. Um, with uh, the field of cryo -EM. So at the beginning I was struggling because, for example, picking all the particles was not fully automated. And so I had to do this, for example, by hand just at the beginning. Luckily then now we have some, some tools to do this automatically. But also this analysis tool, for example, the PCA analysis to see really the motion. It's something that is fairly new, I would say. So um, at the beginning, for me, it was really difficult to see if I could um, see at all these, these different uh, coupling motions and these rotation using cryo -EM. So I think this was the biggest challenge. Um, and of, also, of course, with all these different variants, I had something in mind 
I design the variants to behave in some way. And then I go to the turf microscope and actually the particles are behaving in a totally different way. And so also to understand really what was going on and why my modification that I did for some reasons in my um, in my mind, they were different. And then I had really to realize, okay, actually I wanted to do this modification, but for doing this, I had to do something else. And this influenced um, the whole structure much more than I thought. So um, for all the challenges and the lessons you learned during this, in this project, do you think anything you learned can be applied to um, engineer other molecular devices or anything you learned can also be helpful for other molecular programmers? It, it depends, I think, a bit on, on the type of, um, of molecular um, motors or, or uh, machine that you want to build. Because, of course, if you want, for example, to do um, translational motor, there might be other challenges that a rotational motor does not have and also the other way around. But I think what is very valuable or, or the lesson I learned for me was really, um, for example, for the cryo -EM, how really to handle such a complex um, object. And yet yeah, also how to combine all the different um, techniques together. So how to really understand what cryo -EM was showing me and also combine these with um, fluorescence microscopy data. And I think, um, like personally, I can use this for the future, of course, but maybe it might be useful also for, for other, other people uh, if they're struggling with this um, to combine like structural information with dynamics information, which is also what I think structural biologists are doing, right? So they, they're combining always maybe cryo -EM with other techniques to understand what's going on. And here is more or less the same thing, but from a different point of view, because we were the one um, designing the structure. So we have already in mind what it should do, more or less. Do you have any like project management advice for the rest of the field? Because you guys really made a <clears throat> kind of an awesome giant structure here and then characterized it in many different ways. Like, How did you keep this all under control and ma maintain a project over so many years of work? So actually, I'm a really organized person. And I really like to, you know, um, have lists of everything and uh, have everything organized very nicely and uh, like related to um, number of, of experiment and date and so on. So it was it was actually quite funny for me to do this because I, I really enjoy it. But of course, it's it's um, yeah, it's a very huge um project and also with different you know different foldings different uh, assemb assembled structure and some are for cryo -EM, some are for um, fluorescent microscopy but also our university had some tools of course to to keep track of everything some wiki for example as as also lab books online lab books and then there um, if you have everything online it's also easier because you can always find past things very easily and register everything how many spreadsheets were there? Well, I never counted them, <laughs> so I don't know. So I think now you're working on kind of using biomimicry to study nuclear pore complexes. Um, how did you end up, so you, you first moved from physics to kind of this biochemistry, DNA nanotechnology into this, and now you're going more into traditional biochemistry and biophysics. How, how did you end up going into what you're doing now? So what I would really like to do also in the future um, is to build a more complex biomimetic system. So let's say I started with a, a small one. So the ATP synthase, I tried to reproduce this mechanism. And now I move to something a little bit bigger, which is like the nucleus um, of a cell. And um, like with these nuclear pore complex that are also involved in the transport of protein. And I would really like um, to use for example, DNA origami, but also other biomimetic systems to understand what's going on in the cell and also to, to build some artificial system that mimics um, the biological ones. And so it was kind of, um, in a way, it, it's um, I started from a, a small um, system, let's say, and now I'm going to a bigger one. And I hope one day maybe to... Um, 
to go to an even bigger one, for example, replicating a whole cell or, or even maybe some artificial tissues or something like this. So for people who maybe aren't so familiar with nuclear pore complexes, could, could you elaborate a bit on what those are and what you're hoping to achieve with, with mimicking these structures? Yes, of course. So we have um, nuclei in our cell, of course, and it's very important that through, for example, the nuclear membrane, only the right proteins grow through because we have the DNA there and we don't want to harm our DNA. So there's this nuclear um, pore complex that are gatekeeper of the nucleus. So they kind of decide what's passing through and what's not passing through. And it's also in both direction because there are, of course, also some proteins, some complexes that want to go from the inside to the outside. And these are really massive protein complex. So it's basically an oct octagon. So it is um, it has this eightfold symmetry and it is formed by all these different uh, proteins that are called nucleoporins. And we have this scaffold that is eightfold and then we have like a mesh of unfolded proteins in the middle. And these form kind of a sieve, let's say, that um, let some molecules pass through and some other don't, um, don't. And like the nuclear pore complex has been studied now for quite a few years, but it's still unclear how really the mechanism of this transport works. So what we would like to ach achieve with our biomimetic system is like first to simplify all this, all this complex system because instead of having all these, you know, huge amount of proteins, then we can really focus on one and really see what's the role of this and maybe with some few interactive components. So it's, it's of course, uh, a simplified model, but we hope that it is still um, revealing some interesting details and some important details of, of the real system. So are you building this out of DNA again, or is this a more complex structure you're going to build? So we are using different, um, different elements, different components, but I'm also using DNA origami. So there are some publications um, that came out recently about using like the DNA origami rings or octagons as are, as scaffold for this nuclear pouring. So for these um, disordered proteins that are um, present in the in the center of the nuclear pore complex. So you're currently doing this in the Netherlands, and then you saw in Italy, and you've also been to Germany. Have you noticed any big differences between? the countries and the institutions within them across Europe? So yeah, there are differences between the institution, of course, because um, it depends a bit also on the focus of uh, also every group. Well, while I was in Italy, I had not really a chance to do um, a lot of research because I was there just for my bachelor's. And for my bachelor thesis, I was um, doing some stuff for um, astrophysics. So it was really completely different. And there I was not in a lab. We, I was um, taking some data from, micros uh, from telescopes, um, but I was not really in the wet lab. So I don't have a lot of experience in, in a lab in Italy. The difference between Germany and Netherlands in the two groups that I've been in are not really super huge. They're quite comparable um, also because the uh, like, for example, just simply the amount of people that we that we had back then and also now, it's almost the same. So um, it did not change a lot also from the organizational point of view, for example. I think the most thing is that you have different instruments um, and um, different maybe technicians or lack of technicians. And, and this is what makes a difference. But... I, th I think also the biggest difference is not difference is not maybe not really on the country, but really on the single group. Thank you so much for joining us, Eva. Stay tuned to our newsletter for details on our next podcast episodes. And thanks for listening.